Let's review chapters 15 through 18. So this first question here deals with bonds, right? So price company issues $2 million, 10 year, 8% bonds at 97 with interest payable each January 1st. Part A, we need to prepare the journal entry to record the sale of those bonds on January 1st of 2019. And then in part B, it says assuming that instead the bonds above were issued at 104 instead of being issued at 97, what would that journal entry look like to record the sale of the bonds? So let's first deal with issuing the bonds at 97. So that at 97 is telling us how much cash we're going to be receiving, right? So when we issue bonds, we are getting money. So this journal entry is going to include a debit to cash and a credit to bonds payable, right? So our bonds payable amount, that's just gonna be the face value of the bond. So that's our $2 million. Our cash amount, is when we take that 2 million and we multiply it by 97%. Because when it says that they're being issued at 97, that's being issued at 97% of the face value. So 2 million times 0.97 gives us this 1,940,000. Now you'll notice your debits and credits don't equal, right? And so then that's where this third account's going to come in. Since we issued our bonds below 100% of the face value, that means that we have a discount on these bonds payable. So this discount is that $60,000 difference between the bonds payable face value amount and the amount of cash that we actually received. Now, how about if these bonds were issued at 104. Well, we're still going to be debiting cash and still crediting bonds payable. And bonds payable, once again, is just that face value. Our cash amount, this is where things are going to change. So the cash is now this $2 million face value times 1.04, this 104%. So we're actually receiving $2,080,000. Since we're issuing it above face value or at 104% of face value, we're getting more money than the bond's face value. Now, once again, your debits and credits don't equal. We have this $80,000 difference, right? Well, when we issued it below face value in the last example, we call that a discount on bonds. When we issue it above face value, we call it a premium on bonds payable. So that $80,000 is our premium on bonds payable. Now our next question here it says Anderson LLC had the following transactions pertaining to debt investments. So debt investments are when a company is purchasing bonds from another company, right? They are investing in another company's debt. So here, our first transaction, January 1st, 2018, purchased 35 $1,000 Taylor Corporation 5% bonds for $35,000. Interest is payable annually on January 1st. Uh, December 31st, we have to accrue the interest. On January 1st, we receive the interest, and then we also sell some of these bonds, and then we have to accrue the interest again the following December. So let's first work on purchasing these bonds. So we are buying 35 separate bonds from Taylor Corporation. Each bond is worth $1,000. There's a 5% interest rate, and the amount of money that we are spending is this 35,000. So we're going to debit an account called debt investments and credit our cash. And for how much? The $35,000 that we are spending on these bonds. 
So the number of bonds, the face value of each bond, and that interest rate, that's all going to come into play later on. Right now, we just needed to take that 35,000 amount to put into our journal entry. Now we need to accrue the interest on the Taylor Corporation bond. So the accounts that we're going to be dealing with here is a debit to interest receivable because we are going to be getting this money paid to us, right? We are the investor, so we are the one that will be receiving the interest. So we'll debit interest receivable and credit our interest revenue. Now for how much, right? Well, our interest formula is principal times rate times time. Our principal, that was that $35,000. Our rate was 5% and our time is one because it's been one full year since we purchased these bonds. So we multiply that out and we get 1750. Now the following day, we receive the interest on those Taylor Corporation bonds. So we need to show that we're receiving cash and decrease our interest receivable in this entry for how much? The 1750 that we just calculated for our last journal entry, right? Because now we are actually receiving that interest. So we need to decrease our receivable account by that amount and show that our cash is increasing by the 1750. Now, after we received that interest, we decided to sell 15 of these Taylor Corporation bonds, and we sold them for $18,500. So how are we gonna journalize this one? Well, we need to show that our cash is increasing, right? So we'll debit our cash in this entry because we are selling the bonds. So we are going to be receiving money in return. Then we want to credit our debt investments because if we're selling some of these bonds we're going to have less debt investments now right so when we purchased these bonds if you recall we debited the debt investment account to increase it here we're selling the bonds so we need to decrease our debt investments and let's talk about the numbers here right so the cash amount will debit our cash for 18,500. That's just the amount of money that we are receiving. Debt investments, we're going to need to calculate that one. So this is when we take a look back at the face value of these bonds, right? So the $1,000 per bond times the 15 bonds that we are selling. And that tells us that we need to credit our debt investments for 15,000. Now you'll notice, once again, debits and credits don't equal. That's a problem, right? We're off by, what is that, $3,500. So what happened here? Well, we sold debt investments that on our books were worth $15,000. But we were able to get people to pay us $18,500. So that means that we have a gain on the sale of debt investments for $3,500. Right, because what we sold on our books was only worth 15000 but we got people to pay us more. And since we got people to pay us more for these bonds, we had a gain on the sale. And the gain on the sale is just the difference between your cash amount and your debt investments amount. Now we need to accrue the interest on our Taylor Corporation bonds for 2019. So the accounts are going to look exactly the same as when we accrued the interest last year, right? We debit interest receivable and credit our interest revenue. What's going to change here is our numbers. And here's why. Our principal initially was 35,000, but then we just sold some bonds at the start of this year. And the bonds that we sold were worth 15,000, right? So we want to subtract out that 15,000 of the bonds that we sold from the 35,000 that we had initially. And that tells us that 
throughout this year, we had $20,000 worth in principal for these bonds. So 20,000 times 0.05 times one, because it's been one year again, and we get 1,000. So we toss that into our journal entry. Now question number three, Met's company had these transactions in 2019. Indicate whether each transaction resulted in a cash flow from operating activities, investing activities, financing activities, or non-cash investing and financing activities. Right, so this is dealing with chapter 17, your statement of cash flows. So we have a list of transactions here and we need to figure out which type of activity this would fall under. So the first question to ask yourself is, is cash involved? Uh, because if cash is involved, then we can think about, okay, is it uh, operating, investing, or financing, right? Now, you'll also remember, once we get to the statement of cash flows itself, we have some non-cash expenses that pop in too, right? So we need to keep that in mind as we're working through a statement of cash flows. Now, let's start here with this first transaction. Issued $50,000 par value common stock for cash. Well, so cash is involved, right? And we're receiving this money because we issued some common stock. And whenever you issue common stock, that's gonna fall under a financing activity. Now, purchased a machine for $30,000, giving a long-term note in exchange. Nowhere in that transaction does it mention cash, right? We got a machine, the machine's worth 30,000, but we didn't pay cash here we gave a long-term note in exchange, which means that this is a non-cash activity. Now issued $200,000 par value common stock upon conversion of bonds having a value of $200,000. Once again, we don't see cash involved. So this is a non-cash activity. Now declared and paid a cash dividend of $18,000. Now we see cash here again, right? We're paying this cash dividend. Well, whenever you pay a dividend, that also falls under the financing activity section. Our next one here sold a long-term investment with a cost of $15,000 for $15,000 in cash. We see cash is involved, and since we're selling a long-term investment, that falls under our investing activity group. Our next one collected $16,000 of accounts receivable. So accounts receivable is a current asset, right? And whenever there's changes in current assets, we're gonna see that as an operating activity. Now the last one here paid $18,000 on accounts payable. So we're paying out some money. Accounts payable is a current liability and current liability changes fall under operating activities as well. So now we're given some comparative balance sheets for Rojas Corporation. And we need to prepare a statement of cash flows for 2017 using the indirect method. So you'll see that we're given some accounts over on the left, and then we're given 2017 data and 2016 data for each of those accounts. And then down below, we're given some additional information. We're told that net income was 22,630, dividends declared and paid were 19,500, uh, no non-cash investing and financing activities occurred, and then it tells us that the land was sold for cash of $4,900. So we're gonna use all of that information now to prepare a statement of cash flows. But the best thing to do first is to go through and pick apart these comparative balance sheets and figure out what changes happened, right? So our first one here, accounts receivable, 
decreased by 2,200, right? In 2016, it was 23,400. Now it's only 21,200. We see that land decreased by 6,000. There were no changes in the buildings, but you do see that depreciation increased here, right? It was at 10,000, now it's at 15,000. So you, that must mean that you depreciated an extra 5,000. So that's going to come into play because that's one of those non-cash expenses, right? We were talking about that earlier. Non-cash expenses are going to be added back in in the operating activities section. We'll talk about that more once we start preparing our statement of cash flows. Accounts payable, you see that that decreased uh, almost $19,000, right? Went from $31,000 down to $12,000. Common stock increased by $6,000, meaning that you issued some more common stock. And then we take a look down at this additional information we see that net income was 22630 That's important to us because that's how we're going to start off our, our statement of cash flows. We see that we paid dividends worth 19500 We see that the proceeds from this sale of land was $4,900. And why that matters is because when we take a look back up at the top of the screen, we see that land decreased by 6,000, meaning that we sold land that was worth on our books $6,000, but we only received 4,900 of it, which must mean that there was a loss on that sale of $1,100. So that 6,000 that we see as the decrease for land doesn't get included in our statement of cash flows. The pieces that will be included from that will be the proceeds of 4900 and the loss on the sale of the 1100 So now we have all of this information here, right? All of the changes that happened. But once again, let's go through and figure out, okay, what's operating, what's investing, and what's financing. A change to accounts receivable. That's going to be an operating activity. Depreciation expense. That's one of those non-cash expenses. That's going to fall under the operating section. A change to accounts payable. That's in the operating section. Common stock increase. That means that you're issuing common stock. That's a financing activity. Your net income, that goes at the top of your operating activity section. Pay dividends, well, whenever you pay dividends, that's going to be a financing activity. Proceeds from the sale of land, you are selling a long-term asset, right? Land falls under our long-term asset section. And whenever you sell a long-term asset, that's going to fall under investing activities. And then the loss on the sale of land is also going to fall under operating. Uh, it's kind of like our depreciation expense. So the reasoning here, we're going to see once we start filling out our statement of cash flows. So our cash flows from operating activities, we start off with our net income. So our net income took into account our non-cash expenses and our loss on the sale of the land. However, you didn't actually have to pay out any money for our depreciation expense or pay out any money for the loss on the sale of the land. So we have to add those back in in this operating activity section because these are all adjustments to reconcile our net income to the net cash provided by operating activities. So that's why you see depreciation expense and the loss on the sale fall under this operating activity section. So our first one here, the decrease in accounts receivable. So we know that the number is going to be 2200 but then the tough part here is to figure out, is it going to be a positive or a negative 2200 right? So 
if your accounts receivable decreased, we can think about, okay, what is that doing to our cash itself? Well, if accounts receivable is decreasing, that means that someone is paying you back, right? So we received $2,200. So we'll make that a positive $2,200 here in our cash flow statement. Depreciation expense, we want to add back in that non-cash expense because that took away from our net income, so we need to add it back in here on our cash flow statement. Decrease in accounts payable. What would need to happen for your accounts payable to decrease? Well, you would have to pay someone back, right? So that means that your cash is going down. So we make this a negative 18,730. Our loss on the sale of the land, that would have been taken out of your net income while calculating your net income. So we need to add it back in here on our cash flow statement. And then we add up those four numbers and we get this negative 10,430. So then we can use that amount to find the net cash provided by operating activities, which is our net income minus 10,430, and we get 12,200. Now, if that 10,430 amount was positive, we would add it to our net income. But here it was negative, so we subtract it out. And if that 12,000 amount was a negative number, the change that would happen would be that it's no longer net cash provided by operating activities, but rather net cash used by operating activities. So we've completed the operating activity section. Now we can go into the cash flows from investing activities. Now we only had one, right? We just had the sale of the land. And how much did we receive? We received 4,900. So since we only have one, we don't need to add it all up and show the net cash provided by investing activities. We just toss that 4,900 along to the far right and we show it as a positive because when we sell the land, we are receiving the cash. So then we can move on to cash flows from financing activities. So we had a couple different financing activities given to us, right? We had the issuance of common stock. So if you are issuing common stock, that means that you're, you're selling stock, right? So what are you going to be getting in return? You're going to be getting cash. So that means that our cash would be increasing. So we make this a positive 6,000. Now we also paid some cash dividends here of 19,500. And if you paid dividends, that means that you're losing cash, right? Because we're giving that cash to our shareholders. So we make that 19,500 a negative number. We can then find the net cash used by financing activities as this negative 13,500. So again, remember, whenever that's a positive amount, it's net cash provided. Whenever it's a negative amount, it's net cash used. So up in our operating activities, we had a positive 12,000. So it was net cash provided by operating activities. But then down here in our financing activities, we had net cash used by financing activities. So it shows up as this negative number. Now, with that, we can find our net increase or decrease in cash. How do we do that? Well, we take our net cash provided by operating activities, our 12,200, add in our net cash provided by investing activities. That was just the 4,900 from the sale of the land. And then we subtract out the net cash used by financing activities of 13,500 to see that throughout the year, our cash increased by an amount of $3,600. Then we want to list out the cash at the beginning of the period. So that would have been the cash from our first year 
on those comparative balance sheets. So that was our 10,700. And then we can add those two together to show the cash at the end of the period. So that would have been your cash amount from the most recent comparative balance sheet uh, amount. Now question number four says the following data are from the income statements of Haskin Company. So once again, we have 2017 data and 2016 data. We have sales revenue, beginning inventory, purchases, and ending inventory. With that information, we can compute the inventory turnover and the days in inventory for each year. So let's figure out inventory turnover first, right? That's your cost of goods sold divided by your average inventory. So your cost of goods sold is going to be your beginning inventory plus your purchases minus your ending inventory, right? Beginning inventory and purchases is everything that you could sell. It's your goods available for sale. We subtract out what we have left over at the end, and that tells us how much we did sell throughout the year. So for 2017, our beginning inventory was 940,000. Our purchases were 4,340,000. And our ending inventory was 1,020,000. So we find that our cost of goods sold in 2017 was 4,260,000. So that's our numerator in our inventory turnover formula, right? Now we need to figure out our average inventory. So your average inventory here is going to be your beginning inventory plus your ending inventory divided by two. So for 2017, we add up our beginning and ending inventory, divide that by two, and we see our average inventory as $980,000. So now we have our cost of goods sold and our average inventory for 2017. So the 2017 inventory turnover, we plug in those amounts and we can see that we turned over our inventory 4.35 times. We can then use our inventory turnover amount to find our days in inventory, telling us on average how long does this inventory sit in your warehouse. All right, so we take 365 divided by 4.35, our inventory turnover, turnover that we just found, and our days in inventory for this 2017 information was 83.91 days, meaning that on average, your inventory sat there for roughly 84 days. Now, let's do this for 2016. So we find our cost of goods sold by taking our beginning inventory plus our purchases minus our ending inventory, all from the 2016 information. And our cost of goods sold will be $4,581,000. Our average inventory, once again, we want to take our beginning plus our ending divided by 2. So 860 plus 940 divided by 2, and we'll get an average inventory for 2016 of $900,000. So 2016's inventory turnover, we plug in the cost of goods sold and average inventory that we just found. And that inventory turnover is 5.09 times. So in 2016, we were turning over our inventory more throughout the year, right? So with a higher inventory turnover, we'll see what that does to your days in inventory, right? So 365 divided by 5.09, and we can see that that means that your inventory spent less amount of time in your warehouse. The days in inventory in 2016 was about 72, right? So with a higher inventory turnover, you're going to have a lower days in inventory. Now question number five, we're given a comparative condensed income statement for Navarro Corporation. 
with this information, we need to prepare a horizontal analysis using 2016 as the base, and then prepare a vertical analysis of the income statement. So let's start with horizontal analysis. So horizontal analysis is also called trend analysis, right? So it's all dependent on a base year. We were told that 2016 was the base year, which means that in 2016, everything is just 100% of itself. Now, in 2017, we're going to compare each individual line item to the amount that it was in the base year. So for net sales, we take the 2017 amount of 660,000 and we divide it by the 600,000 that we had in net sales in 2016 to get this 110%, right? Meaning that your net sales increased by 10%. So if you're trying to figure out the percent increase or decrease, that would be just an increase of 10% in this case. Or we could say that 2017's net sales were 110% of 2016's net sales. In 2016, now cost of goods sold, we take the 2017 cost of goods sold amount, divide it by the 2016's cost of goods sold amount, see that our cost of goods sold increased by 15,000 or 15%, right? So not only did our net sales increase, but so did our cost of goods sold. So your gross profit, we take 2017's, divide it by 2016's gross profit, and we see our gross profit in 2017 was just 98% of 2016's gross profit. So we had a little bit of a decrease in 2017 with our gross profit. Now operating expenses, we take 125,000, that's 2017's operating expenses. We divide that by the base year of, of uh, 2016's operating expenses, and we get 104%. So showing that our operating expenses are going up too. Now your net income, we take 2017's net income, divide it by the base year's net income, and we see that our net income is just 86.7% of our base year. So we take a look at this horizontal analysis. There's good news and bad news that we can take from this. The good news is that our net sales increased by 10%, right? That's, that's wonderful news. However, your expenses went up. Your cost of goods sold increased by 15%. Your operating expenses increased by 4%. So because of those increase in your expenses, even though your net sales went up by 10%, your gross profit was down and your net income was down, right? So we can take both positives and negatives from this horizontal analysis that we just solved for. Now let's talk about vertical analysis. So vertical analysis takes a look at just one singular year at a time. Horizontal analysis, we were working with trends, right? Using a base year. Uh, vertical analysis is just all within one singular year. Now, vertical analysis for an income statement, everything is going to be based off of that year's net sales. Vertical analysis of a balance sheet, everything's going to be based off of that year's total assets. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that your net sales is going to be used as your denominator amount when calculating these percentages. Just like how we used a base year in our horizontal analysis. So let's take a look at our cost of goods sold. So our cost of goods sold in 2017, we take the 483, the cost of goods sold amount, 
and we divide it by 2017's net sales. For 2016, we take 2016's cost of goods sold, and we divide that by 2016's net sales. So when you divide those, you can see that cost of goods sold were 73.2% of our net sales in 2017, and they were 70% of our net sales in 2016. Gross profit, we take each individual year's gross profits divided by that year's net sales, and we get our percentages there, 26.8% in 2017 and 30% in 2016. Now, operating expenses, we take that year's operating expenses divided by that year's net sales. So in 2017, we take 125,000 divided by 660,000, and we get our percentages there. 18.9% in 2017 and 20% in 2016. Net income. We take that year's net income and divide it by that year's net sales. We get 7.9% in 2017 and we get 10% in 2016. Now it's a little bit trickier to see when we're looking at 2017's data because of all of those decimals. But if we take a look at 2016's information, that's some nice clean numbers for us. And we think about the relationship between these five line items on an income statement. Net sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. If we look at 2016's numbers, that's 100 minus 70 equals 30. Right, so that all worked out. Operating expenses are then subtracted from your gross profit to find your net income. Well, 30% minus 20% equals 10%. Right, so when you're working on a vertical analysis here of this income statement, that relationship's going to remain true. Right, so your amounts should work based off of that as well. So that would be a good check for you. Um, as you're going through preparing this vertical analysis.